AMT. Good evening and welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. Tonight we will meet Jonathan Tassini, a labor activist who has announced this week that he's going to run against Hillary Rodham Clinton for the U.S. Senate nomination, believe it or not, here in New York State. Then later we will take your phone calls, especially if you're confused about Medicare Part D, the new Medicare prescription drug program. We'll have somebody here to give you advice because so many people are confused about Medicare Part D. And then later on we'll meet filmmaker Jem Cohen, who uh, has made a film called Chain, which tries to make the point that so many cities are so much alike these days because of corporate culture. So, first, Jonathan Tassini. Yes, somebody has challenged Hillary Clinton from within the Democratic Party. Let's meet him. Hello, welcome to Brian Lehrer Life. It's a pleasure to be here, Brian. Uh, so, tell us, who is Jonathan Tassini? Well, I've been a labor organizer and a social activist for the last 25 years of my life. I most recently ran the National Writers Union, which was a union for freelance writers, a national union. And I left there about two years ago and mostly have been doing union organizing campaigns across the country, both political and organizing. So for somebody who's interested in unions, for someone who's interested in the fate of labor, why challenge Hillary Clinton of all people? She is a rock star in the Democratic Party. Well, she's certainly has celebrity, and she certainly has high name recognition for many. Uh, I would argue that many New Yorkers don't really know where she stands on most issues, and that a lot of the celebrity and name recognition obscures that. And obviously, uh, I found actually that many people were shocked to find out that she voted for the Iraq War, which has cost the lives of 2,100 Americans and wounded many more thousands of people, and has actually a position about the war that is not too far from the Bush administration. On labor issues, she's just as bad. This is someone who still thinks NAFTA was a good thing. So I look forward to traveling upstate in areas that have been devastated by so-called free trade and talk to people about their current senator and say, is that the kind of senator you want, someone that's going to basically ship your jobs to China? Let's talk about the war, because I think okay. that is your number one breakout issue. Uh, I looked at your website today, and your first endorsement comes from Cindy Sheehan, the anti-war activist. So how do you think you and Senator Clinton are different on the war, never mind the vote in 2002? How are you different on the war today? It's night and day. Uh, my opponent says, and I, as I said, I don't think it's far from the Bush administration, she believes that we need a winning strategy. I believe there is no such thing in this war. You can't win this war. And number two, she talks about all of a sudden, and she just did this in a mailing to her constituents, that she now envisions sometime a beginning of withdrawal of troops in 2006, which is essentially no position because she doesn't say how many and when. It might mean that we would withdraw 5,000 troops and they may stay there another 10 years. I'm for withdrawal immediately. I, I have the John Murtha position. Have you been to Iraq? I have not, no. Have you been in the military? No, I have not served in the military. How do you know you're more right than Hillary Clinton? Well, um, I have a fair amount of knowledge about the, the, the positions. I think of myself as a fairly uh, intelligent person who likes to ask lots of questions and talk to experts, both military and not. And frankly, when you're on the same side as John Murtha, it's hard not to feel like you do have the same position. Here's, if I haven't been in the military, highly decorated Marine, I'm happy to be on the side of John Murtha. We can take phone calls from you on Senator Hillary Clinton. Has she, begin, has she been a good senator? Forget about her presidential run for now. You can call that, about that if you want, her potential presidential run. Has Hillary Rodham Clinton been a good senator for you here in New York State? Would you entertain the possibility of voting somebody running to her left in the Democratic primary, labor activist Jonathan Tassini? 212-251-0801. You should see it on your screen, 212-251-0801. Or if there's anything you want to ask uh, Jonathan Tassini or tell him he has guts or tell him he's out of his mind or whatever it is, you can call up and, and uh, do it right now. You know, Senator Clinton was in the news this week uh -huh. for coming out against flag burning, or not just against it, but that there should be a, a law against it. I find it appalling. And I can't do better than the New York Times, which had a wonderful editorial to say, which, which said, Senator Clinton in pander mode. 
Uh, I think at a time when Americans are being killed in Iraq, where they are being wounded, where we have 45 million people without health insurance, people are having their pensions ripped off by companies, here is someone raising a hot button issue that does not affect people's lives at all. When was the last time there was a flag burning in this country? I have no idea. It's outrageous, and I, I think that it is em emblematic of the, my opponent, the incumbent senator, to do that kind of pandering to try to uh, pander to some other constituency in order to further her positions. I, I, all I can say to the voters in New York, I will never pander to people like that. I have had rock-solid positions, and I would never do such a thing. Maybe with people fighting and dying in Iraq, no matter what you think about the war, it's a bad time to burn a flag because of the message that it would send to the troops and what the flag means to many of them. Well, the flag also means to me the First Amendment. The most important, uh, one of the biggest principles that we have in this country is that people can speak out and say things. And the, the, the First Amendment was designed to protect the minority even if the majority thought that they were wrong. And in a case where someone goes and blurs a flag, you may not like that, but somebody should have the right to do that. That's the American way. And Senator Clinton is trying to essentially, in my opinion, eviscerate the First Amendment, one of the most important things in our Constitution. Let's take a phone call. We have a lot of people who have a reaction to you challenging Hillary Rodham Clinton. And uh, let's see, it's Nathaniel in Flushing. Hi, you're on Brian Lehrer Live. Good, uh, good evening. How are you, Mr. Tassina? How are you? Doing great. Great. I am so glad you're running against Ms. Clinton. I, I feel so uh, betrayed by her. Uh, I, she, I, she voted for this war. She, even with all the evidence that points towards us being um, deceived and misled, she still voted and gave Mr. Bush uh, her consent, and I, I'll never vote for her again. I'm so glad you're there to stand up for what's really going on. All right, thank Nathaniel, you very thank you very much. Do you know him? No, don't okay. know him, but glad to have you around. Let's go to another one. Uh, let's see. How about uh, Joe on the Lower East Side? You're on Brian Lair Live. Hello, Joe. Yes, Brian. Hi. I listen to you every day. It's great to see a face thank with uh, your voice. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would vote for Hillary Clinton again. I did the first time, and I stand behind her. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of Democrats voted for the war, uh, but she's now against the war, and there's a way to get out of Iraq, and it's going to take some time. Well, when you say she's that not. she's now against the war, obviously Jonathan Tassini doesn't think so. How do you understand Hillary being against the war? In what way? Well, she, she, she did state that the information that the Democrats did receive from the Bush administration was misleading. So based on what we were given, uh, you would vote for the war as well. It was a terrible thing, but we were misled, and now we have to stay in Iraq until we can, you know, have a civilized uh, democratic uh, government there. Okay, thanks a lot, Joe. Jonathan. Let me respond to that. Uh, if I was on the Senate floor at the time of the vote, I would not have voted for the war. I would have stood with Barbara Boxer, Ted Kennedy, and the late Paul Wellstone and voted against it. Hillary Clinton and senators who voted for the war abdicated their responsibility both to the American people and to the Dem values of the Democratic Party. There was plenty of information about the situation in Iraq, and while Saddam Hussein was a despicable tyrant, there was no reason to embark on a war of choice. This was not a war of necessity. Saddam Hussein <laughs> did not present an imminent threat to the United States. By the way, Nathaniel and Flushing and a lot of you may be interested to know that tomorrow morning, speaking of John Murtha, on the radio show we're going to play an extended excerpt, about 10 minutes or so, of Congressman Murtha's news conference today where he responded to President Bush uh, talking about his plan to pull the troops to the periphery, as he says, and take a whole different approach in Iraq. So we'll play Congressman Murtha tomorrow at 10 o'clock on WNYC. That's AMA 20 and 93.9. Jonathan Tassini, one of your big issues is Walmart. Mm -hmm. And you say that Senator Clinton has a relationship with Walmart that you don't approve of. What is that relationship? Well, first of all, she was on the board of Walmart for six years prior to Bill Clinton running for president. Their headquarters are I, in Arkansas. Arkansas. I understand that. And in fact, it's, it's important to look at the, the context of who that, that person is. Um, Hillary Clinton worked for one of the most anti-union law firms in the country, and they represented some of the worst uh, anti-union firms, the poultry industry, Walmart, Sprint, Beverly Enterprises. And Hillary Clinton really should say, what was she doing on the board of Walmart while workers were being fired and Walmart was essentially oppressing people from trying to have a union? And even today now, she takes money from Walmart. In fact, on Walmart, you have identified what you call the Walmart 22. Is that 22 members of the... Uh, Democratic Party in Congress supporting Walmart somehow? It was, the, it was a, a vote in the House on an amendment that would have, prevent, that would have prevented the, uh, de uh, uh, the Department of Labor 
from using any money to trying to enforce this agreement you might have heard about where Walmart cut the sweetheart deal with the Department of Labor to avoid fines. And it was an amendment uh, put in by, I can't remember the member of Congress, 22 Democrats voted against the amendment, essentially voted to support Walmart, Walmart's position, which you, I find to be appalling. You know, there are many people who say, on balance, Walmart is good for America. Yes, they're trying to cut back on health benefits, like all companies are, things like that. Mm -hmm. But they have been such a market leader in lowering prices on so many things that on net balance, they're, net, they're, they're, on balance, they're net positive for working class Americans. Why not? Well, I don't agree with that because we, ha we have different roles in our lives. Sometimes we're shoppers, and sometimes we're workers, and sometimes we're, we serve other roles in our community. Uh, as shoppers, yes, there's no question that keep, people can benefit from Walmart, but why do many people go to Walmart? Because they can't afford to go anywhere else because wages are so low. And certainly when Walmart pushes down wages, that has an effect on the economy throughout. Let's take another call. Howard in Bayside. You're on Brian Lair Live. Hello. Hi, Brian. Hi, Mr. Tassini. I'm Hi. a New York City public school teacher. I guess this is an unrelated topic, but um, I wonder where you stand on No Child Left Behind and uh, the New York City public schools. Howard, tell us real briefly, how do you as a school teacher think No Child Left Behind is affecting education here in New York? I think there's been too much focus and emphasis put on the tests, and um, it's, it's redirecting our energies into a place where I think um, it could be used. All right, Jonathan Cassini. Well, I, I, you probably know this better than I, frankly. You're, you, you're out there in the front lines, but I, I think No Child Left Behind was, is appalling, and it has put, uh, I, you know, we have a crisis in the public schools, but that has to do with, I think, the lack of money. We should be pouring money into schools, and when you're spending $200 billion on a war in Iraq, rather than building elementary schools, uh, hiring more teachers, uh, obviously, you're going to have a crisis in the public school system. So, again, Senator Clinton has voted for a, a war that is draining money from an economy and particularly hurting uh, schools and other services. Jonathan Tassini, my guest, here on Brian Lehrer Live. He's hoping to run against Hillary Rodham Clinton in the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate next I year. I am running, not hoping. Well, you're hoping to get on the ballot. That's true. Let's put it that yep. way. How tough is that going to be? It's a challenge. You have to gather 15,000 signatures, and they also have to be spread out in a certain way throughout the state to show that you have both the quantity and the, and the breadth of the support. So, and we think, you know, there have been people coming to our website, which, by the way, is TassiniForNewYork.org, and already saying, how can I help you? I live in this county or that county here in the city. I want to petition and help you. So I, I, I think we're going to put an army out there, and we're going to get on the ballot. Have you ever run for office before? I run a lot for office, for union office. I ran, uh, I think it was seven times for union office, elected each time, but this is my first foray into the political arena out in the electoral world. And what's your own electoral history? Have you ever voted for a Clinton? I decline to comment on that. Really? I mean, I, yeah, it's my own... Um, I mean, it's your right. It's but my why right. Why would you decline? Because it, obviously that becomes in, that might be the be, it's the in the context of this race. I think it's not important and uh, not relevant. I don't want to make an issue of that. Do you want to say who you voted for in the last few presidential elections? Um, I did vote for um, who did I? Yes, I did vote for John Kerry. I was just checking, but I believe I voted for him on the Working Families Party uh, line. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the Working Families Party. Uh, believe in independent parties. And in 2000, Gore or Nader? I did vote for Ralph Nader. Okay. Uh, let's take another call. This is Raj on Coney Island. Hi, you're on Brian Lair. Is that Raj? Is that who it is? No, I think it's Thomas and Laurelton. I'm sorry. Hi, Thomas. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, for Mr. Cassini, it, he has a lot of good ideas, but uh, I'm thinking given that he's going to have no political connections, when he, if he gets elected, he goes to Washington, how is he going to rectify our balance of payments issue, given that we pay so much in federal taxes and get back so little in terms of aid? And there's been a continuous um, deficit in that, going back to when we had much, much more well-connected people in office, such as Senator Moynihan, uh, Alphonse D'Amato, uh, Jacob Javits. Now we have uh, Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer. And they have a lot more Washington connections and clout than Mr. Tassini will when he goes there. And they have more right. of a, a bigger national profile than he does. Let's get a response. Can you bring home that bacon? Well, I think just to clarify for the rest of you, I think what the caller was referring to is that uh, the New York pays more in taxes and gets less back in aid in various ways. Uh, look, 
if I go to Washington, um, many people have been junior setters before. If you look at Paul Wellstone, other people, there's many ways you can have influence, and that's partly about building relationships. But, you know, I'm not going there to try to get along and just uh, go in the, what, what's going along in today's politics. I want to shake things up. We need to have health insurance for every person in America. So besides the war, one of the things I'm arguing for is that every single person should have Medicare in this country. And the only way you're going to do that is if you go to Washington and are willing to stand up to the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry, which Mrs. Clinton never did. Be careful with health reform. That brought Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton down, didn't it? Well, I think that they botched that. I give them credit for understanding that there was a crisis in health care, but they botched it precisely because, and it really, I think, talks about who their relationships are, they, they would not take on the big powerful interests. And in fact, you're right, because they weren't willing to take on the interest, they weren't re wanting, willing to have real health insurance, then for 10 years we couldn't talk about it. For the last decade we could not talk about it. And look at the crisis we face now because of that. I've been on your mailing list as a labor activist. My condolences. For uh, about six months. I, I reviewed, once I saw you were running for Senate, I reviewed my inbox and saw I got 35 emails from you <laughs> uh, since May. And a number of them were on the topic of pensions, something mm -hmm. you're obviously concerned with as a labor activist. And just this week, Verizon announced that it's going to end its defined benefit, old-fashioned pension plan uh, for its managers, for its middle managers, uh, and put their money into a 401k instead. What do you make of that? What's the context of that in the national Well, it is, scene? it is really a scandal and outrageous, and I don't know why there aren't people marching in the streets um, over the issue of how pensions are being stolen from people. We have to remember, pensions are is deferred compensation. This is money that someone said, I'm not going to take it now, I'm going to put it away for later, and now they're not getting it. And the company and, said, I'm not going to pay you now, I'm going to pay you when you retire. It, in effect, is a contract to pay you at age 65 or whatever it is, and now they're breaking their end of the deal. They're breaking their end of the deal, and they're using the legal system by running into bankruptcy court to force the bankruptcy court to abrogate those. So you have companies like Delphi and General Motors and potentially others who are not going to fulfill their, their pension so obligations. So does Senator Clinton, to your knowledge, have a position on what to do about pensions, and do you have a position? Well, I have a position. Uh, who knows what her position is? Uh, Senator Clinton really does not take leadership on anything of significance to working people. I should say that I went to her website today to look up the pensions issue in particular because this is hot right now in New York State with Verizon, which is a New York company, and I know it's one of your big issues. Yeah. There was nothing on her website regarding the issue of pensions. She does not take any leadership position, anything important to Amer average Americans. Our position is, and you can go to our website at TissiniForNewYork.org, um, I'm suggesting something called universal pension system, where people would actually have a pension that they could have that was portable, and you could actually have a defined benefit. It takes into account the notion that we are a changing workforce, that people don't necessarily stay with the same companies for the, their whole workforce, their whole work life. Barbara in Manhattan, you're on Brian Lehrer Live. Hello. Hi, is that me? Yes, you, Barbara. Oh, that's kind of embarrassing. That's not actually my name. My son is called and says a little bit. Anybody so can call us Barbara, anyway. even <laughs> guys. Go ahead. Um, he might, well, I'm a Democrat, and I consider myself a progressive Democrat, and yet I supported the invasion for reasons other than the stated ones of the administration. I still thought it was a good idea for different reasons, and the different reasons is sort of a political dispute we can have with the administration, but it doesn't go to the foreign policy issue. And all I would suggest to anybody who's running against Senator Clinton is that they stop vilifying people who supported the war for good reasons and maybe arguable but valid reasons having nothing to do with the, what the Bush administration claimed and emphasize, you know, long-standing democratic issues like the ones that he's talking about now, the pension security and financial security and social issues and all of this kind of stuff. Barbara, I think you've got enough viewers curious that I'm going to ask you very briefly, why did you support the war? Um, to support... <laughs> beleaguered people in other parts of the war, in other parts of the world, which I think is... Because Saddam Hussein was a tyrant and you wanted to see them liberated. Yes. And also because I don't believe that we... Cre and that was the primary reason, but secondarily, I don't believe, and I'd have to say that I even agree with, uh, with uh, Vice President Cheney, that we didn't create the phenomenon of the people who were going in there and kidnapping and beheading and killing innocents. You know, it's not like... Or presence there caused that to happen. I don't believe that an invasion here in New York City right. would cause me okay. to kidnap. I'm going to leave it there. Barbara, thank you very much, okay. or whoever you really are. And Jonathan Tassini, a lot of people will say that. Don't run on the war. Run on the Democratic Party core issues, the meat and potatoes issues, 
that really make a difference to people's lives day to day much more. Well, I think when you have people being killed in, in Iraq, our own men and women, our children, our, our sisters and brothers, that's a core democratic issue. And I think when you're spending $250 billion that should go to building schools, to meeting human needs, that's a democratic values issue. So the war is a central thing, and I, I believe very strongly that it's something that we have to address, and really we're going to fight, and we're going to try to end this war. Bill in the West Village, you're on Brian Lehrer Live. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, I enjoy your program very you. much, uh, Mr. Lehrer. Uh, I, w I was wondering uh, uh, what Mr. Tassini's stand is on the Defense of Marriage Act and, indeed, the subject of gay marriage. I, I didn't hear the last part. Subject of gay marriage, gay marriage. and the Defense of Marriage Act. The, um, look, uh, I believe that the government should stay out of people's bedrooms and leave people to do what they choose to do. And uh, I've always been a believer in that. And I, I think that the Bush administration's attempt to basically uh, target gay people is outrageous. I noticed that your website address, as you told it to me, is Tassini for New York, which echoes Dean for America the website of Howard Dean uh -huh. when he was a presidential candidate. Are you a Howard Dean fan? Well, actually, I'm a Paul Wellstone fan. Paul Wellstone was one of my political heroes, and we explicitly took his slogan, which is, vote for what you believe in. Um, it, Paul Wellstone is one of those people, you know, you remember, where were you when? And when he died, I was crushed. And I remember, I think that if we had 51 or 55 Paul, Paul Wellstones in this country, we would be a much different country. Because the Republican Party probably salivates at the idea of people like you defeating Hillary Clinton's in Democratic primaries because they think they're going to wipe the floor with you in uh, the general election. Well, you know, I've said this, and I said this at my announcement speech uh, in front of the press. I don't believe that we're, what we're running on is really at left to right. When you look at who's against the war, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents are against the war. When you ask who's without health insurance, that Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, who are the working people who are being, having their pensions ripped off and having their jobs shipped to an authoritarian regime in China? That's across the spectrum. So, and, and, I, and the reason I love Paul Wellstone so much is he ran in Minnesota in a state that was fairly conservative in lots of parts. And people who were conservatives voted for him because they understood he was authentic and that he was trying to protect their rights. Jonathan Tassini running against Hillary Clinton in the Democratic Senate primary, if he can get on the ballot next fall. Thanks a lot. Pleasure to be here. Coming up next, advice on the new Medicare prescription drug program. Are you or someone you know confused, like so many people are? You can call in now with your questions at 212-251-0801. This is Brian Lehrer Live. Mrs. Johnson, good to see you again. Uh, this is Mike. You can trust him. He looks just like you. Plus, two against one is more intimidating when we force someone to sign a loan. And I'll be sucking up to you in order to keep up the illusion. So, here are your low monthly payments and interest rate, as we promised. Here's where they triple. The rest of this stuff, I don't think a lawyer can read this. It protects us. Make sure we get your home when you can't pay us back. Such a lovely house. Yeah. But don't worry, we're going to sell you credit life insurance. You don't really need it, but... It puts lots of cash in our pockets. You look nervous. We better hurry and get you to sign. Or I'll pretend to ruin your credit with one phone call. Predatory lenders are never this easy to spot. Call us and protect yourself with the facts. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Education, equality, protection, advance humanity. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live every Wednesday night this fall at 7.30. How confusing is Medicare Part D, the Medicare Prescription Drug Program? Well, you can choose from 46 different plans, each of which has different premiums and deductibles and a different list of covered medications, many of which 
don't tell you up front what those covered medications are. And for some seniors, it's not a good deal at all. So what should you do or your loved ones do? We'll try to give you some good advice now and take your calls for our guest, Ido Bannock, General Counsel for the Medicare Rights Center. If you have questions about Medicare Part D or stories to tell about your own research or attempts to sign up, call us right now at the number on your screen, 212-251-0801, as we welcome Ido Bannock from the Medicare Rights Center. Thanks a lot for coming in. Thanks for having me. People need discussions like this right now because so many are so confused. I wonder if you can tell me just from your experience at the Medicare Rights Center so far, mm -hmm. what are the top three issues that you find are sowing the most confusion? Okay. The first question is, I have fill in the blank. Should I or should I not sign up for the plan? And then the second part of that is, how does this coordinate with the Medicare Part D coverage? The, the, and that's the top question that we're getting. How does it coordinate with? With the, a Medicare Part D plan. So the first, the first question is, should I be in this world at all? All right, let's start okay. with that. Okay. How does somebody know not to sign up? Okay. Who should not sign up? That, that's the, the easiest, probably the easiest question. If someone has creditable coverage, creditable means as good as or better than Medicare, they don't need to sign up. And How do you know if your coverage is as good as or better than Medicare? Good question. All employers, unions, and everyone else who's been providing coverage is, are, are required to send a letter to whoever they were covering saying, your coverage is creditable. Everyone should have gotten a letter from their fill-in-the-blank uh, saying your coverage is credible. Um, I even received one from my former employer. So people are, are, who are not on Medicare even getting these notices. Your, cover, your coverage is credible. Credible, which means as good as or better than what uh -huh. Medicare Part D covers. Now that's interesting. Why would an employer, if uh, let's say you're on a, some kind of a, you know, a, a, a retirement uh, medical plan, mm -hmm. part of your pension or whatever, right. why would an employer take that step? Wouldn't they want to get rid of you? Mm -hmm. Good question. The Medicare uh, Modernization Act 2003, which created this benefit, established a subsidy for these employers to not get rid of you. In return for getting essentially 28 cents on the dollar, they agreed to send you a notice saying this is creditable and in return they would receive this money. Okay. And it was meant, it was meant to basically uh, uh, incentivize the, the, whoever was providing coverage before to continue providing that coverage at least right. for a little bit. So how do <clears throat> I then go about starting to select among all these plans? Okay, so if it turns out that you don't have anything that's creditable and you do have to opt into this world, uh, you have to make a choice, and the two most important things here that I tell everyone are think about what drugs you take, think about where you get those drugs. So you, you need to make sure that the drugs that you take are on the plan's formulary. Formulary means a list of covered drugs. And what pharmacy do you go to? Each plan will have a different network of pharmacies. Those are the two most important things to make sure that you, got, you have access to the drugs that you need. And there's also no way to predict what you're going to need in the future. Obviously, right. for people who are taking some kind of prescription drugs right now, that's a good thing to do. Right. But one of the things that's, that's scary to people right. is the knowledge that life is unpredictable, health is unpredictable. Somebody doesn't know if they're going to get cancer in the future or heart disease in right. the future or diabetes in the future. And I guess the fact is that some of these plans are better for one or the other or the other of, those, of the medications that go with those diseases. Yeah, you really need a lawyer, accountant, and, and, and a crystal ball yeah. in order to determine what plan is best for you. The only thing you can do right now is choose based on what's best for you now and choose a plan that uh, has a formulary that's robust enough and that's covered by enough pharmacies and that's a, a, a trusted name so that you can at least hope that it's going to be there in a few years and hopefully cover whatever your needs are going to be uh, in a few years, too. How do the companies do it, by the way? How do they decide that we're going to cover these drugs but not these drugs, and some other company decides we'll cover those drugs but not those drugs? They negotiate. Um, pharmaceutical companies provide a, a series of products, and the individual plans have negotiated, usually through two or three middlemen, um, to provide this drug versus that drug. And it's, it's a competition and it's a bidding to determine what drugs are actually going to cover. All right. I private said, market. I said we're going to take your calls and give you advice on your situation. We'll do some of that right now. 212-251-0801. You see the number on your screen. And Sydney in Manhattan, you're on Brian Lair Live. Hi, what's your question? Uh, do I speak through my phone? Yes. Oh. Right through your telephone. All right. I'm 74 and a senior citizen. And... Uh, Right now, I have hip VIP, and uh, 
they have a formulary. I don't pay uh, a monthly premium, and I have coverage up to 2000 they told me, after which I can use my Epic card, which I sent away for and received, which will cover me for that 3600 gap, at which point they will cover me again. And so your question is? My question is, uh, I take Xanax for anxiety, the generic form. How do I know that will still be covered? Uh, they've been giving it to me for the last 12 years in HIP VIP. Okay, what would you say to Sydney? The, the, you should call HIP VIP and determine whether uh, starting in 2006 under their, under their new Part D plan, that's going to be on their formulary. So you should ask them the question, will this be covered by my plan in 2006? The second part of that is what you said you, are, you also have EPIC. Is that correct? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, if you have Epic, and Epic has generally what's called an open formulary, it covers almost every drug. So if, even if, HIP VIP doesn't cover your drug, it is probably the case that Epic is going to cover it. Now, Epic, and thank you for your call, Cindy, is a plan in New York State. Right. That's for who in particular? It's the Elderly Pharmaceutical Insurance Coverage Program, so only for the over 65 Medicare population. Disabled individuals, and this is a whole other issue, we're trying to expand Epic, but for now, Epic wraps around the Part D benefit and it provides prescription drug coverage for the over 65 Medicare population. Patricia on the Lower East Side, you're on Brian Lair Live. Hello, what's your question? Uh, my question is if I have medications that cost say $7,000, and I want to get past the donut hole, wouldn't I be better to take something and get me past that donut hole as quickly as possible, uh, okay. past the 35, uh, uh, 3500 or 3600 as quickly as possible so I can get 95% back? Now we've got a vocabulary term. Okay. Donut hole. Okay. What is donut? Okay. What, what do donuts have to do with Medicare Part D? Yeah, it's making me hungry, but donuts, the donut hole is a coverage gap. The way that this plan was designed, because Congress only had X amount of money to go uh, to get through it with and still had to overpay drug companies, is that they created a program that had, had certain coverage in the beginning, a coverage gap in the middle, and pretty nice uh, catastrophic coverage at the end. So the gap in the middle, mm -hmm. after those first expenses right. and before some later expenses, right. has to come out of pocket, and that's what's known as the donut hole. Exactly. And there are only three things that count, three major things that count towards that um, catastrophic level. The money you spend, the money that your family spends on your behalf, and the money that a, a, a program like Epic spends for you, or a charity. So four things, really. In order to get something that, that uh, uh, counts towards that coverage gap, you have to uh, spend it on drugs that are on your formulary. Okay? So if a drug is not on your list of covered drugs and you spend money out of pocket for it, that doesn't count towards really? the catastrophic coverage. And that's important. People need to realize, people say, well, I want to go to Canada to get uh, my prescription drugs or I want to pay out of pocket for a certain amount of time. That's fine. You just won't get to that catastrophic level. So the caller's question was about how to get past that donut hole the best right. way. And the best way to do it is to get a plan that covers the most of your drugs, make sure that it, it has fairly good coverage, and you're going to have to spend a significant amount of money out of your own pocket, unless you're eligible for Epic, uh, in order to get to that catastrophic level. We've got a few more minutes to take a few more phone calls about you or your loved one and Medicare Part D. If you want to get your calls in, do it right now, 212 251-0801, 251-0801 for Ido, Ido Bannock from the Medicare Right Center. Now, your center has also right. filed a lawsuit against the federal government because you're concerned about? There's one group of people that have no option whatsoever come January 1st, and that is dual eligibles, people with Medicaid and Medicare. Get their coverage through Medicaid right now. They're going to transition into a Part D plan automatically come January 1st. And that's a lot of people because Medicaid people. is the government health plan for the poor. Right. Medicare is for the elderly. Right. Since there are a lot of elderly who are also poor, right. many people have both. It's about half a million people. and it's In New York State? Right. And people that have been who don't make a choice by January 1st will be enrolled in any old plan, a random plan that may or may not meet their current drug needs with a list of covered drugs. We feel that the federal government has done this transition, it's a one-day transition, in a way that will ensure that at least some people show up to the pharmacy on January 2nd or January 3rd 
hand the pharmacist their Medicaid card, and are told, sorry, it doesn't work anymore, and by the way, you're not on any plan. Go away. Or if they are on a plan, that plan either doesn't cover their drugs or that pharmacy isn't affiliated with their plan. So a little more time is needed in order to uh, fully figure this out. So people are being kicked mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. Medicaid right. with respect to prescription drugs Correct. when this takes, Correct. takes effect. Correct. And if they say, you know what, I don't want to sign up for this benefit, I'm opting out. New York State Medicaid has made the amazing uh, policy decision to drop them from Medicaid entirely, altogether. From all Medicaid? All Medicaid. Not just prescription Correct. drugs? That's right. But even if they opt in, aren't mm -hmm. they likely to have worse coverage than they did before because Medicaid prescription drug coverage was pretty expansive? In New York, they're guaranteed to have worse drug coverage. In other states, they may have better drug coverage. But here in New York, we have a fairly good and generous uh, Medicaid prescription drug program. When is your case going to be heard? Well, we filed our, our, our complaint. We filed a preliminary injunction motion, and our case is probably going to be heard by the judge in the next two weeks. All right. Let's take another call. Uh, we're going to go to Jay on the Upper East Side. Hi, you're on Brian Lair Live. Yes. Uh, I wanted to know uh, where you guys could find, uh, where one like, like I could, since you said you were going to be going off shortly, where one could find uh, the kind of expertise that is being demonstrated by the young man talking to you, and you, of course, too. But where one could get access to that after you go off the air? Uh, of course, it's a good question, and we were going to get to that at the end of the segment, but we oh. can get to it right now. Oh. Where sure. should people go? You Either can call your website or phone number or other organizations. Yeah, if you have access to the Internet, it's www.medicarerights.org. Uh, or if you prefer to call, it's 1-800-333-4114. Medicare Rights Center has counselors available between 9 and 3 every day. Uh, also, the Medicare, uh, the federal government, Medicare.gov or 1-800-MEDICARE. I'd call us first. Give the phone number again because I know a lot sure. of seniors do sure. not have access to the web. That's right. Our number is 1-800-333-4114, and the Medicare number is 1-800-MEDICARE. Okay. Um, so much is said about has been said about the confusion. There are so many plans, and each right. plan has a different formulary right. and a different price and everything else. But to some degree, isn't that a good thing? Because we would rather have choice right. than have the government impose a one-size-fits-all plan on everybody. That's generally true, given um, universal access to information and the ability to sift through that information. Um, Sometimes there can be so much choice that it can become a little paralyzing. Uh, this is just a really rapid transition and a big change for so many people. Uh, it may be better for the federal government to have, it may have been better for the federal government to have done this uh, as it does for Medicare Part B through the federal government itself. Purchasing power to negotiate lower prices and at the end of the day people would have a uh, reliable a benefit that they've uh, come to know and trust. Dennis in Richmond Hill, you're on Brian Lair Live. Hello. Hi, how you doing? Okay, how are you? Uh, I went to the com computer site for Medicare, and I filled out uh, my prescriptions, and I filled out my pharmacy, and I thought I'd get a list of a, few, uh, of a few plans, but I got like all 47 plans. Right. And some of the plans, they, they don't cover my pharmacy, and I'm not sure whether they cover the, uh, the drugs. Right. So what should he do? Well, what, what you're going through is a fairly common thing, uh, which is confusion over which of uh, the plans cover your, uh, which of the plans are accepted by your pharmacy and cover your drugs. I would urge you to call the Medicare Rights Center, 1-800-333-4114, uh, or 1-800-MEDICARE to have a counselor help you with uh, your decision-making process. No one's going to make your choice for you, but they can definitely help you winnow down the choices. All right. Good luck. The president says he wants people to sign up for Medicare managed care plans, right. not just prescription drug managed care, but to use this as an opportunity, if they haven't already, to sign up for general Medicare managed care. Right. Do you agree with that advice? No. Uh, Medicare managed care is a good idea for some people. For the most part, the incentives built into any sort of managed care program are to deny care because they get a certain amount of money and they make a profit off of what they don't spend on you. And what we've seen with Medicare is that the incentives are to deny, deny, deny. Uh, and in order to actually get the care that Congress has said you can get, should get, uh, you have to go through a, a, a crazy appeals process. 
Uh, for the most part, people are much better served by Medicare, traditional Medicare, original Medicare. And there are plans that are not <laughs> managed care, but right. that are Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage? They're standalone plans that people can get in addition to the traditional original Medicare that they know and love, uh, and they get a separate private plan as kind of an add-on. And Barbara in Jamaica, you're on Brian Lair Live. Hello. Hello. I'm uh, <laughs> a person that's on Medicaid and Medicare. And I'm also on a fixed income. And I'd like to know when all this stuff goes through in January, how in the world do I get my medication? I get about 10 medications. Or, uh, maybe twice a week I get medication. Now, Bar Barbara's in that <clears throat> category that you talked about before. Right. That's the center of your lawsuit, the right. concern of your lawsuit. So right. She's on Medicaid as right. well as Medicare. Right. She will lose that Medicaid prescription drug coverage That's in right. January. What should she be doing today? Well, I would urge you, Barbara, to, to check your mail and see if you've received a yellow letter in the last couple weeks. And that yellow letter from Medicare should tell you what plan you've been assigned to. You should then take that plan and call 1-800-MEDICARE and have them tell you whether they cover all of your drugs. If that plan doesn't, you should immediately choose another plan with either their help or the Medicare Right Center's help. That's the best way to make sure that you can get the plan that'll meet the most of your needs. Barbara, oh, have you gotten you. such a letter? Uh, hello? Have you gotten such a letter? No, no, I got a letter that told me to look for another letter, so I haven't received it yet. Okay. Well, I would, I would urge you to call the Medicare Rights Center, and we can, we can help sort that out. You should have received a yellow letter. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. What Thank you was very that much. number again? 1-800-333-4114. She got a letter telling her to expect another letter. This is the point we're trying to make in the litigation, is that letters are flying left and right. People, for the most part, have no idea that there's a change coming. Um, they've become paralyzed by all of the marketing coming at them. The government sent a whole bunch of things out there, and people really have no sense of the fact that their um, health care is going to change in a very real way come January 1st, and, and in a way that will affect um, their health needs. You know, if I wanted to devise a conspiracy theory, yeah. I could say that somebody created a Medicare prescription drug program that was designed specifically to turn people off to the very idea mm -hmm. of government health care mm -hmm. because the bureaucracy is so ridiculous in this plan. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. think they did that, do you? I, you know, I, I don't think they did that. I think there may be other, other conspiracies here. I think certainly that the law was written with the, the help of the pharmaceutical and insurance industries, that the fingerprints are all over it. Um, I, you know, oddly enough, I think that the bureaucracy here doesn't come from the government itself. It comes from the various levels of private entities who stand uh, between the government financer of this health care uh, and the individual. Uh, but you're right. The perception is that this is an incredibly large bureaucracy. Where do you think this situation is going to be five years or ten years from now? You have Democrats who say they only voted for this because flawed as it is, it's a start. Right. And they hope to fill in the donut hole in right. the future. They hope to fill in other gaps and flaws in it in the future. You have Republicans who say, well, this is a nice idea in theory, but we really can't afford it, and it's going to bankrupt us as we go forward unless mm -hmm. we trim the original plan, what's going to happen to this new Medicare Part D in five or ten years? Well, I think for one thing, one thing that's going to happen, and, and this is, will drive uh, the cost down, is that the federal government will have to find a way to bring, to negotiate prices on behalf of all of these individuals. I think unless it manages to do that, this entitlement program is going to grow out of control and people on the right are going to scream about how expensive it's become. I think what may happen is what happened with the Medicare catastrophic, uh, which was passed in 1988 uh, and was repealed in 1989. When because seniors revolted. Banged on Dan Rostenkowski's car, saying, we don't want this. Congressman and Rostenkowski, yes. That's right. And if uh, similar things don't happen, if changes don't happen to the Medicare Modernization Act, I see a similar thing happening now. As I've gone and done these talks and I've seen the anger out there, um, I think that, that in the next year we're going to be seeing more and more of that. You mentioned that issue of the government not negotiating for price. Right. The government, under President Bush's direction and the Republican leadership's direction, has taken the position right. that it would be unfair for the government to negotiate with drug companies for the best price because the government is so big, that the Medicare population is so big, that they would have too much clout in those negotiations. Mm -hmm. If ever there were an argument for universal health coverage, 
That's precisely the point. This is not something amenable to a private market. Prices should be as low as possible so that people can afford their medications. And this is not a process for private companies to make money hand over fist. Reasonable uh, uh, profits, sure. But, but exorbitant profits, absolutely not. And not, not at the government's expense. Give your number one more time. Sure. 1-800-333-4114, the Medicare Rights Center. Edo Bannock from the Medicare Rights Center. Thanks a lot for coming in and taking calls. And we will put that number on the CUNY TV website a little later tonight. That's at CUNY TV, in case you want to refer to it later on. Coming up next, filmmaker Jim Cohen shows us some footage from his movie called Chain, revealing how commercial culture is making cities in different parts of the world look more and more alike. This is Brian Lerlai. Some of New York's most admired figures don't sell out concerts. They'll never be a running back for the Giants. And they probably won't go platinum. But to millions of kids, their teachers are still the biggest heroes in the world. Join New York's brightest. Teach NYC. Prominent professors, outstanding students, illustrious alumni, all on the Emmy-nominated magazine show about CUNY. Hi, I'm Valerie Vasquez. Join us this Sunday when we'll bring you the stories about the people and programs that make CUNY a place where you study with the best. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live every Wednesday night this fall at 7.30. Chain is a film about two different people who inhabit the same landscape. They live in a world filled with corporate structures. One woman is an American who has left her home to spend her waking hours in a shopping mall. The other woman is Japanese and in the U.S. to research theme parks so her company can build one back home. It's shot like a documentary, but the characters are fictional while their situations are scripted. The environment depicted by the film is real. In fact, it used shots and buildings from over 100 different locations to make a point about corporate culture making everything the same. Here is a clip from Chain. They get used to you, mall security, and it's hard to know if that's going to be a good thing or if it means they'll start wondering about why you're around so much. I found a broken cell phone outside at the bus stop. I got this idea to sit and act like I'm talking on it inside the mall. And since then, security pretty much leaves me alone. With me now is the director of Chain, Jem Cohen. Hi, welcome to Brian Lair Live. Hi, Brian. Tell me more about that character. Is she homeless? Well, that character, um, there's the suggestion that there's been some kind of credit card trouble that she's gotten into, and she uh, is essentially homeless, living in an abandoned uh, house, and she has gravitated towards a place where she feels that she would be comfortable and where she might be able to survive, which is a mall. Um, that's the kind of environment that people are increasingly used to, familiar with, places where kids spend a lot of their time and essentially grow up. And so I felt it was uh, actually a logical thing for the character to do if she was out of money and moving across the country and in trouble. So before we show another clip from the film, mm -hmm. talk about how you shot it. Do we see right. in each scene that seems to be taking place in one mall right. shots from many different malls? 
Yeah. I mean, basically, uh, I worked for uh, seven years on the film, and I shot for about three years just collecting these spaces. And I, I dis realized in the course of my travels and in the course of my filmmaking that I could find myself just about any place on the planet. So where, for example, give us uh, well, an idea that, that, you know, how disparate Berlin, these places. Berlin, Melbourne, Berlin. Los Angeles, really? Really South Carolina, Carolina uh -huh. New Jersey, uh, did I say Melbourne, um, Poland, and basically in any of those places you can find yourself in a location that is essentially indistinguishable from any of the other places. And that is the nature of these of these of these chain environments. That's the point. It's that supposed is the to point. be comforting and reassuring for exactly. that very reason. Exactly. But there's also the fact that we generally think of regional character as an essentially comforting thing. And yet the eradication of regional character is is part of the corporate project for uh, a globalized comfort. Instead and of something unique about home exactly. being comforting, something the same about international corporate culture becomes right. sort of faux comforting. Right. Let, let's look at another clip. Um, here the Japanese character in the film, Tomiko, describes her experience in a motel. In the middle of the night, when I could not sleep, I stood and looked down. I felt like I was floating above the shops. Down there, I can see the swimming pool at the health club. The pool looks beautiful, lit up inside. Then I saw small movement, like an insect, like a ghost. But it was only a night worker cleaning. So, to be clear, is that a hotel in a mall? Um, one of the things that I stumbled into in my research and travels and shooting, which are sometimes all taking place at the same time, is uh, I found that I was put into a hotel, and when I went to open the window on one side, I could look out onto the street. On the other side, I was looking down into the courtyard of a mall. Um, I also found that in an airport where uh, basically, um, from one window you'd look out onto the runway, and the other you'd be looking into uh, a sort of combination mall uh, atrium airport space. And so, uh, increasingly, not only are these spaces uh, kind of indistinguishable across the planet, but within one space, you'll find a kind of conglomeration of similar corporate spaces that are serving different purposes. So that character is researching theme parks for her company back home in Japan that's considering building one. Right. Did you make that character Japanese for a particular reason? Well, th that story is one that came directly from a, a real world situation where Nippon Steel uh, was having problems with their steel factory and decided to convert it into Space World. And so they sent people out across the globe to sort of analyze and study how the pros make their theme parks. And so I, I, I actually found th th this situation and applied it to, uh, to my character. The characters are drawn from the real world. They're drawn from headlines and corporate websites and uh, some of their situations seem extreme or far-fetched, but given the nature of things like Enron, um, and there, there's very little in the movie that's actually really extreme or far-fetched. Well, we'll see another clip from the movie in a minute, but why did you choose to make a fictional narrative film with the feel of a documentary? In fact, I understand that some people come out actually thinking it's a documentary if they didn't know what you did. Right. Well. Um, I'm interested in the gray area between documentary and, and narrative, and the thing that, that, that anchors the film is this collection of years and years and years of gathering what is essentially documentary footage, entirely undirected, unmediated footage of these spaces. And what I found is that I could, I could join them together and create what I call a super landscape, and you really couldn't tell 
when you're going from Atlanta to you know to Melbourne to Los Angeles and I also realized that I could sort of discreetly drop the characters into that landscape by having somebody for example be in a hotel room where you can't tell where they are and they look out of a window and I use a shot that I made three years ago and put it next to a shot that I made someplace entirely yeah. different and it's entirely seamless and so the interesting thing for me was to approach the subject matter not through making a kind of didactic documentary where I would have a point of view and kind of hammer it in um, with facts and talking heads and that kind of thing but to to take it on in terms of how people are navigating these places and to try to it's very experiential in that way. It's uh, very people experiential. People describe the, the character of Amanda as uh, less of a person and more of a thought experiment. And I want to play one more clip right. of Amanda, the American character, and we will see her here in her environment of choice, the mall. Uh, that'll be her coming down the escalator and walking around the pole. You kind of have to look for her here. You know how when you're swimming in a lake, the water gets different depending on where you are? There are these pockets of cold or warm that you pass in and out of. Well, sometimes when you walk around the mall and you're not really supposed to be there, it feels sort of like that. I used to shop in a lot of these stores. When I worked at a mall, you'd just know everything that came in and find the best deals and all. Now I just look at things. There's a lot of new stuff coming out. down the escalator, up the escalator. So you've made your point. We right. just have a minute left. But what is really lost if malls are the same in New Jersey as in Melbourne? Because they're just a little part of the city. Once you get out of the mall, then you can kind of figure out you're in New Jersey or you're in Australia, can't you? Can't you? Can you? <laughs> um, they're not really a little part of the city. Increasingly, they are the city. I mean, even in Manhattan, which would have been a difficult place for me to shoot in for the most part because it still feels a little bit like Manhattan, you've got over a hundred Starbucks. When I started making the film, they were putting up a Walmart every, about every four days. When I finished making the film, it was every day and a half. So the, the point is that it's, <coughs> this is increasingly the world that we live in. And I wanted to make a film that essentially forced the viewer to just look at it carefully and then to explore right. it non-judgmentally through, through human film. beings. We're out of time. Chain is coming out on DVD soon, right? Coming out on DVD. Okay. Yep. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Here. And that's it for tonight's Brian Lehrer Live. We are here live every Wednesday night at 7.30. Next week, it may be just hours before a transit strike deadline next Wednesday. If so, we'll bring you the latest. Meanwhile, join me every weekday morning at 10 for my radio call-in show. That's on WNYC, New York Public Radio. Tomorrow is the U.S. losing its competitiveness in science and technology. That's 10 o'clock tomorrow morning on AMA 20 and 93.9 WNYC. Have a great night.